Hey there, happy artists, and welcome back to Kyle Heath Art. I'd like to take a moment to uh, welcome all my new patrons this month. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of this, and I hope you enjoy this next video. Um, I'm doing something I haven't done in a few months for this month's video. Uh, I'm going to be doing a live paint along. So this video is going to be a real time recording of me uh, doing a painting. And um, as the painting goes along, I'll be talking about um, what I'm thinking of as I do the painting, my specific goals for the painting, uh, general thoughts on art along the way. And um, this also serves as a good opportunity for a uh, paint along. If you guys want to, um, I'm providing an image of my subject. So as you watch this video, if you'd like to paint along, um, looking at my same subject and painting with me, then uh, all the resources are going to be there for you to be able to do that. Um, but before I dive into talking about this painting, um, just a quick minute to say, I hope you guys are doing well. <laughs> crazy times we're living in, right? Um, we're still in the throes of the coronavirus pandemic, and it's a weird and scary time. And I just wanted to say real quickly that I hope you all are doing okay. Um, I find that during times of stress, artwork can be a great help for finding little moments of peace and centering. And it's funny, I, I say that, but um, creating art when I'm stressed or anxious is pretty difficult for me. <laughs> Generally, I, um, I don't want anything to do with art when I'm stressed out. But if I can get myself to do a little bit of art, um, I tend to, to feel a lot of relief and peace from it. So if you haven't tried creating art and you feel like there's kind of a, an obstacle in your way, um, you know, this week might be a good time to try and knock out a painting even when you don't feel like it or trying to do a little bit of drawing just to see if, you know, maybe that practice of something you love helps you find a little bit of peace when um, there's not a lot of peace to be found right now for a lot of people. So anyways, I just wanted to say that because if you're listening to this when it comes out, um, you know how wild this year has been. <laughs> and I'm thinking about you. I want you to thrive and be happy. And I know that art for a lot of us um, is a big source of joy. So if you're having difficulty creating art, I would say, you know, no judgment there. But um but maybe it's worth giving it a little bit of a try, even if you're not feeling like it. And it's, you know, it's possible that that can be a source of peace for you. It is for me whenever I can talk myself into doing a painting. <laughs> so this month we're doing a paint along of some strawberries. We've, um, we've always got strawberries in the house right now. My wife is craving them and it's still that time of the year where strawberries are kind of in season and so they're really really tasty so we've always got strawberries around and if you guys know anything about me you know that um, I'm always painting fruits and veggies so this is what's been around the house lately and uh, that's given me an opportunity to paint a bunch of strawberries recently Diving into this, um, I'll talk about my, you know, what I did to set up for this painting and all that, but I wanted to start off talking about my goal for this painting. Um, you don't always have to have a hard and fast goal for every painting you do, but I do find that it's really beneficial if when you sit down to paint, um, you're trying to push yourself in some way. Either you're trying to do something new or you're trying to challenge yourself with a specific goal. Some people really benefit from writing down on a sticky note, like, this is what I want to try out this time. Um, and other people, you know, have that mindset of whenever they sit down to paint, they're trying to push the envelope. Whatever type of person you are, I would say in any way that you can, it's good to 
Try to work on something when you sit down to paint. Try to challenge yourself or do something new. So with that in mind, um, I wanted to talk about what I'm trying to do in this strawberry painting here. My goal for this painting was to try and channel an artist named Felicia Fort. So her last name is F-O-R-T-E. Um, she does a lot of portrait paintings, but what I really like about her is Felicia Fort has a real knack for creating very strong shapes in her paintings, shapes of color. So Felicia doesn't overblend. She uses the colors of paint to create the blending. And I'll go into more of that as, as I go along, what I mean by that. But basically, Felicia's really good at creating strong shape language. She doesn't blend everything together. She keeps things crisp and strong. And I wanted to channel that in this strawberry painting by making a painting that isn't super detailed, um, but you look at it and you just think, boom, these are strawberries and they've got pop and power and pizzazz. <laughs> so that's what my goal is for this painting, is to create strawberries with strong shape language. So you'll notice that this is kind of a tiny painting. This is a six by six canvas panel. And um, you'll see that the panel is like kind of scratch painted with this orangish tone. Um, the way I did that was I, I mixed an orange color with acrylic paint. And then I, uh, I dabbed some on, I painted it on, and then I used a paper towel to kind of rub things in. And that's where if you see those like kind of scratchy shapes, that's paper towel. I just crumpled up paper towel and scratched it around till it had a nice texture. Um, before, if you do this, before you paint on it with your oils or whatever you're using, um, you want to make sure that the, uh, the painting dries. So that's going to take about a half hour or so for, um, for the acrylic base layer to dry. Might take a little bit longer if you lay it on really thick. <laughs> but that's an important thing to note if, if you want to try this technique is uh, make sure that acrylic layer is dry to the touch before you start putting stuff on top of it. The reason why I like this colored base layer is number one, it affords the opportunity for some really cool pop at the end of the painting. As I create this painting, I'm intentionally going to leave this background untouched in some areas. I want the finished painting for some of this orange to pop through. So I'm intentionally painting thinly in some areas, intentionally not covering certain areas. And that's an artistic decision because that orange pop at the end is going to look really vibrant and exciting. You'll see what I mean when you see the finished piece. And uh, I've got a picture of the finished painting if you want to take a look at it now. That way you can kind of see like what I'm intentionally aiming for as I do this. And this is something that over time I may try to double down on even more. Like um, you'll see looking here that a lot of the, uh, the shadow areas of the strawberries that I've already put a little bit of paint down, um, I covered up a bunch there. I, uh, I may intentionally expose more areas down the road to double down on that pop effect. Generally, the areas that get untouched are um, the areas right around the edges of the, uh, the color shapes that I'm making, and then I tend to leave a lot uh, exposed for the background areas. But yeah, so that's why I've got a colored canvas. Um, Another benefit of coloring your canvas, as opposed to using white, is it helps you with your color judgment. And the reason for that is because when you're painting on white, um, it's tricky to determine your values, the lightness or darkness of what you're using. 
white is like the lightest color absolutely possible. So that means that even if you put like kind of a light color of paint onto a white canvas, that color looks a little bit darker than it actually is because it's surrounded by pure white. So when you get a color on the canvas, especially one that's kind of in the middle of the value range, um, it makes your color judging a little bit easier. And you know, it's, it's really difficult to get the exact right colors on the first pass anyways. That's why I generally paint in two passes. That way I've, I've got paint down and then I can rethink you know, how these colors look together. But um, getting a base tone down does make your color accuracy a little bit better on that first run. Speaking of colors, um, you can see that in this live painting, uh, I'm just throwing colors down pretty quickly. The reason for that is because I've pre-mixed my colors. And that's something I do with every single painting. Not necessarily a right or wrong. Um, a lot of people mix as they go. But I like to pre-mix because I can get in there and do a painting quickly. I don't have to keep shifting my attention to uh, another color when what I want is to lay down paint. So generally, before I start laying down paint, I'll take 15 to 30 minutes, depending on you know how many colors I want to mix, and I'll pre-mix a palette to start off with. Now these colors are not going to be perfect. I do my best to get it as accurate as possible, but I know that I'm going to be changing every single one of these colors on the second run, and that's okay. This is just a starting point, but I do, I do want some accuracy for the starting point. So what I'm doing when I premix colors is for each specific area of the painting, I'll mix a light color, a medium color, and a dark one. So, for example, if you look at these strawberries, I mixed three reds. I've got a dark red, a medium red, and a light red. Um, for the foreground, um, I've... well, that's, that's not a good example, actually. It looks like I've just got one color there. But, so for the green part of the strawberries, same thing. A dark green, a medium green, and a light green. And then for the shadow shapes, um, the rest of the painting, for the foreground, I'll mix the light areas, the shadow areas, um, and maybe a midtone. Same for the background, I'll do a light area and a shadow area. And at this point in the painting, you can see all of those there. I might only have three greens, I'm, I'm not totally sure. But, so that's what I'm thinking as I pre-mix, is um, I want to get a good set of colors out there that are close to what my goal is for the painting. The most important part of that pre-mixing is getting the lightness and darkness correct. It's okay if your colors are massively wrong, but if your values are wrong, then you're going to run into some trouble. So that's the main focus when I'm mixing these colors, is paying attention to the fact that I want to make a statement with lightness and darkness, and I'm pre-mixing my colors in order to do so. Um, the way I judge these colors that I've pre-mixed is um, after I've mixed it on the palette, I'll take a glob of it on my palette knife, and then I'll hold it up next to my subject. So the strawberries that are off to my right, right now, that have some light shown on them, I'll stick my palette knife um, under that same light that's shining on the strawberries and see how does this color look compared to the real thing and specifically how does the lightness or darkness look because that's primarily what I'm focusing on. Then if, if I think that's right, I don't need to tweak it anymore, then I'm on to the next color and I just really mathematically go through each of those when I'm doing my color mixing. Kind of sounds, you know, monotonous, but um, I like a little bit of monotony in painting. Um, when I paint, I kind of get into a sort of a flow state where I can kind of do like, you know, tedious mechanical tasks and really enjoy it. 
which is interesting because that's not my personality at all. <laughs> but so when you look at this painting that I'm putting together, um, hopefully by now you'll see a real strong sense of darks and lights, which you can probably especially tell on the strawberries. The right side of the strawberries is very, very dark, and the left side is much, much lighter. And I've pushed this even more than reality. And the reason for that is because I think um, light is the most important aspect of your painting. Making a strong, confident light statement of like, this light is coming in from the top left, um, I think is really powerful in a painting. And so I've specifically designed shapes in order to get that effect of like, you're looking at an area with strong light hitting it. And backing up a bit, I know we're, I'm done with the, uh, you know, drawing at this point, but starting off with this painting, um, I took my brush, took some re dark red paint and, uh, created a drawing of, um, of what would ultimately be my painting. And I didn't focus terribly on accuracy, but what you'll see is I made it very angular and geometric. I tried to introduce a lot of liveliness into the lines. So the focus was energy liveliness over creating a tight, accurate painting. Um, and generally that's my goal when I do a painting is to not focus quite as much on the accuracy, but try to give more consideration to the energy of the painting, the darks and lights. Those, those I think are like bigger wins than, um, than trying to get something that's accurate. And so when I made the, the drawing before I started adding color to all the areas, um, I not only drew the outlines of the strawberries, I not only drew the uh, the cast shadows and that line for the background, but I also specifically drew out what I wanted the shadow shape to look like. So it's almost like a paint by numbers strategy. With my drawing, um, I created areas that I was gonna fill in. I created shapes that were going to become color shapes. Um, and that's a very Felicia Fort kind of strategy. It's generally what I do lately too, but specifically when I'm channeling her, um, I'm thinking I want specific shapes. And obviously I'm gonna refine those shapes a little bit. I'm not doing like a pure color by number, paint by number thing here, but that's the way you wanna think about it is filling in specific shapes. You can get all fancy with it and render in the later stages, but if you don't have a strong shape and color statement at the beginning, you're not gonna get it later in the painting. As a rule, your painting is gonna lose energy as you go. It's gonna become a weaker statement the more you apply paint on it, the more you blend. So starting off your painting with a lot of oomph um, is a good strategy because some of that oomph is going to go away as you, you know, pet at certain areas with your brush, just what tends to happen as a painter. So yeah, there you go. I've talked about my pre-mixing strategy. I've talked about what I'm working on. Um, let's see. So next, let me talk a bit about the size of this painting. Um, you see that this is a six by six painting and um, I see a lot of benefits in knocking out these small paintings that don't take a lot of time. This whole painting took 50 minutes, maybe a little bit less. And I consider that a strategy, especially when I'm trying to improve in something or I'm just trying to get into the studio and paint with more regularity. Painting small makes it much easier to do that. 
So with a small painting, the painting's gonna get done more quickly. That's just a part of painting is bigger paintings, you have to mix more paint. Um, generally, the size of your brush in comparison to the canvas is gonna be smaller. Um, and that, that means time. That means when you're doing a big 12 by 12, it just ends up being more likely that you're gonna spend five hours on it. <laughs> um, and obviously you can go big and bold, you know, get like a big two inch brush and knock out a 12 inch painting. And I think that's a great strategy. Um, but that's one of the, that's one of the benefits for painting small is uh, you're in and you're out a lot quicker. These small paintings end up being a great opportunity for testing new things too. Like I said in the beginning, it's, it's nice to have a goal in mind when you're sitting down to paint, especially if you want to improve. If, if you're just doing this for, for fun, then it, it doesn't matter so much. But if you want to get better at painting, um, having a goal in mind is nice. And when you have a small painting like this, I think it's easier to actually fulfill your goal, to keep one thing in mind. It's harder to go super all in on detail with a small painting, and so um, you don't get as caught up on that. And the, the fact that you're just painting for an hour seems to make it easier to just stick to one thing. So those are big benefits to small paintings. And also, the fact that the painting is small, it doesn't take a lot of time, means that um, you end up being more likely to take risks. If you're like lovingly working on one single painting for an entire week or an entire month or something, do you think you're gonna take big risks on that painting? It's a lot harder to, I'll tell you that. When, when you spend a month on a single painting, trying to work it to perfection, trying to get something that you really love, your tendency is to be super duper conservative with that painting. You don't wanna take risks because, think about it, if you take a risk and that painting fails, I just wasted an entire month. <laughs> I spent a month working on this painting and I've got nothing to show for it because I messed up. And that's a perspective in painting that is not going to lead to improvement. If you're trying to be conservative all the time, if your goal is just to get something out there that you didn't screw up, then um, you're always going to rely on what you've always done. You're gonna, you're gonna lean on the stuff you know you can do well. You're gonna lean on the techniques that you've already tried before rather than trying new techniques. That's the beauty of these small paintings and the beauty of getting into a habit of painting daily or painting consistently is if you totally bomb your painting then guess what? Tomorrow's another day. I'm making an entirely new painting tomorrow. So you know what? I can try it then. And um, you know, you can take another risk tomorrow. Or you know, if you need a morale boost, you can lean back tomorrow on what you know you're good at, get a victory out of the way, and then be bold again the following day. That type of iteration of like pushing hard every time is... Um, it is the key to getting better. It is the key to becoming a great artist. And like I said, that doesn't need to be your goal as an artist. You can do this just to enjoy it. You can do this with the result of getting something that makes you happy. That's totally valid. But I know a lot of you do want to get better. So um, that's a great way to do it. Let me talk about my greens a little bit here because I see I'm starting to lay down some really confident dominant green shapes. And I wanted to talk about green because green is a color that is really easy to get wrong. Um, if you look at your green right out of the tube, or even the green that you just created from mixing yellow and blue, which by the way is how I always get my greens, um, that green that you end up with 
is larger than life, <laughs> is way too green. If you look out at nature, um, all the greens you see are significantly duller than the greens that you mix by squeezing out of a tube or by putting yellow and blue together. And a lot of us don't think enough about that. And so the green that we put down on our paintings ends up being too saturated. Um, and the reason why that's a problem is that an overly saturated green, number one, it dominates the scene, you know, and for this painting, as an example, like this painting isn't about the tops of my strawberries. It's about the redness of the strawberries. So I need to make sure that the greens don't steal the show by being too green. <laughs> and if you look, you'll see my, my palette knife like coming in. <laughs> That's funny. When I do that, I'm, I'm looking at the real strawberries, the subject. Um, and what I'm asking myself right now is like, oh boy, is this green too green? And the answer is yes. On my second pass, I, I'm pretty sure that my greens are gonna be a little more laid back than these ones even. But so that's something you really need to think about when you're putting down green, especially if you're a landscape person or you paint a lot of fruits and veggies like I do. Um, you really want to neutralize those greens. And the way that you neutralize those greens is by adding in some of the complementary color, um, which in the case of green is red. So I'm mixing red into these greens in order to push them back. That's, that's actually how, how I do it. I'm not putting in brown or something. Um, I'm dabbing in a little bit of red into the green because red is you know, exactly opposite green on the color wheel. And that's gonna push green more and more towards a gray brown color naturally. That's the most efficient way to neutralize a color is by um, mixing in a little bit of the complementary color until you're satisfied. Um, these strawberries are, I think, a really fascinating example of contrast because strawberries naturally have these two complementary colors. You've got this really vivid, sometimes really deep red of the strawberries, and then you have those you know, funky green tops. And that's nature creating um, a contrast right there. It's beautiful how it does it. You see it all the time in nature. Um, flowers are a great example of that too. You know, you've always got those green stems and then your flower petals, you know, a lot of flowers out there are reddish, purplish, orangish, you know, um, which is nature creating complementary colors. It's really beautiful. Um, one thing that does is it really draws your eye and as a painter as a visual artist you know that's um that's something you really want to be acquainted with is how to draw people's eyes I put a note here that I wanted to talk about that and uh, I'm gonna jump right to talking about that since we dove in this idea that like just like these strawberries have a um a strong green and a strong red on them, um, that's a form of contrast. And contrast is what art is all about. I'll tell you a little bit more what I mean by that after I take a sip of water. <laughs> so the human eye is fascinated by the idea of contrast. And by the way, sorry, before I dive into that, um, I'm starting on my second pass of the painting now. So I, um, I mix my colors, I put down my first pass, and when I was painting my first pass, I was specifically trying to kind of paint thinly as much as I could, because I knew there's gonna be a second pass that comes after it. So for this second pass, um, I took some time to do a little bit more pre-mixing um, I'll also do a bit of mixing as I go along, but so for this second pass, my colors are going to be accurate 
I'm going to look at each color and see where I got it wrong and get it right. And then I'm going to lay it down on the second pass boldly, just like the first time. But this time I can go really thick. Um, and you know, not, not crazy thick. I'm not putting like two millimeters of a paint down or anything, but I can go thicker on the second pass. I want to like make really confident strokes of the correct color this time and maintain that sense of color shapes. So that's what we're doing right now um, as I'm talking. But uh, back to contrast. So the human eye loves contrast. It is an endlessly interesting game to us. And so as painters, that's what the game is all about. So it's, it's really important to, to think and understand about what contrast is. We think of contrast usually in terms of light and dark. So like, for example, I told you in the beginning that I paid a lot of attention to wanting to make sure you knew that the light was shining in from the left. So we've got these big dark shadow shapes on the right side of the strawberries. Um, and that's me understanding that contrast is really, really important. But contrast exists for more than just dark and light. Um, there's really an endless number of different types of contrast, and every single one of them is a delight to the viewer's eye. We absolutely love contrast. So another form of contrast is like a like a color wheel contrast. So think of what two colors would have the most contrast with each other. What two hues? Um, the ones that are on opposite ends of the color wheel, the complementary colors. So there is a big contrast between red and green because they're as far away from each other as they could be. They make the strongest contrast. That's assuming that um, that you're not colorblind. So that's another form of contrast. Other forms of contrast are the, uh, the saturation or dullness of a color. Again, that's a spectrum where you've got two extremes. And when they're right next to each other, um, you can really notice that. So in this painting, let's see if I do that anywhere. Um, one area where you can probably notice that kind of contrast is if you look at the, uh, the green of the, um, of the tops of the strawberries, the, uh, the darker parts of green are, um, are a little bit duller than the really bright pops that are coming in there. So those situated right next to each other um, forms a strong contrast. Uh, another example of that is um, the redness of the strawberry next to the blueness of the background. Um, the red is a really saturated red and the blueness is a little bit more toned down. So that's a saturation contrast that you're seeing. And then, um, so I could go on forever talking about these different contrasts, but I'll talk about just one more, and that is a shape contrast. So if you look at these strawberries that I put down, you'll see that I've kind of got a small strawberry, a large strawberry, and kind of a medium strawberry. And that was a specific decision on my part because I know that having a diversity of different shape sizes is delightful to the viewer's eye. So I load up every single painting I do um, with small, medium, and large shapes. Another way that I do that is you'll notice that I've switched to a larger brush. And on the background areas and the shadow areas, I'll have large brush strokes. And then on the areas where I'm really refining the detail, um, I'll use smaller brush strokes. And that's another type of contrast. It might seem like a small thing, but it's not. It makes a big difference to a painting um, when you've got this variation between shape sizes. Changing your paintbrush is a really easy way to do this without 
having to to think about your composition too hard. Just uh, bounce around between your brushes and um, you'll naturally get a little bit of that small, medium, large. This idea of contrast is the spice of all of life. It's a, it's almost a game that, that our eyes and our minds play with us. We just love discovering this kind of diversity. Um, and a corollary to that is the fact that we also love recognizing things that are the same as each other. So this interplay between contrast and um, uniformity is just endlessly interesting to us. So a way you might see uniformity in this is like with the color red that I've chosen for the strawberries, you'll notice that I also chose like an orangish reddish, you know, underpainting, and that's going to pop through. And that's a type of uniformity. Even though we've got all this blue paint everywhere and all this purple paint, you're going to see suggestions of strawberry in those little pops that come out of orange around the painting. Um, I don't know if that was an intentional choice for this painting or not, um, but it definitely works. So that's an example of the uniformity side of it. Um, another example would be that like uh, on the left side, um, you've got two strawberries. On the right, you've got one strawberry. So that's a contrast. There's uh, an imbalance there. But um, you've got strawberries on the left side and the right side, and that's a uniformity. So I don't know if that sounds like really head up in the clouds, <laughs> but it's true. It's, it's how people's minds work. And so um, these are opportunities for wins when you're designing a painting. Um, the more that you can think about these themes, uh, the more that the viewer's eye is just going to get really interested in the painting you're making. Um, just because there's a lot to it. There's a lot to see. <laughs> there's a lot of contrast. Contrast is just what we love. So let's see. Another thing I wanted to mention in the painting is... Um, the fact that I'm intentionally avoiding detail. <laughs> One thing you'll notice in this painting is there never ends up being seeds on these strawberries. <laughs> part of that is a bashfulness on my part because I've never made seeds look good on strawberries yet. <laughs> so I'm a little scared. Uh, I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> um, but another reason for it is because I know that in this painting, I don't want it to be about the details. I want you to be able to look at this painting from 50 feet away and know, oh, strawberries. <laughs> that's what it is. And the way that that's accomplished is through simplicity. I've used my strong shapes, my darks and lights, um, in order to really convey the idea of strawberries. And if I've done that successfully, then I don't need detail to sell it. Um, I don't need color to sell it either. Um, and you can test it out to see if I've been successful here. Try taking a picture of this or, or look at my finished picture and turn it into a black and white image on your iPhone. Um, extend it out as far as you can in your hand and look at it. And I bet you, you'll be able to easily tell that this is strawberries we're talking about. You, um, you don't need detail, you don't need color to show the viewer that this is strawberries, baby. That's what we're painting here. And that's powerful. That's what it is to create powerful and um, confident paintings is using really strong sense of contrast in order to show people um, what you're making. So you can do this in the middle of your painting too. If you want to check, like, does this read as strawberries or whatever you're painting? Take a picture of it, turn it into black and white, make it really small, and um, see if you can tell what's going on there. If you can't tell what's going on there, then you probably need a stronger value statement um, in order to, to really show the viewer what's going on there. It might seem like a small deal, but it's not. The, the stronger of 
a sense of value of darks and lights that you can get on there, the easier it is um, for people to read what's going on in the painting. And values are the key to that, your lights and your darks. I said a moment ago that I'm doing my best to blend this as little as possible. The reason for that is because the more I blend, the more I'm weakening that value statement. And I want that statement to stay really strong. Um, so where I do want to create like a sense of shift in my values, um, I do that by the specific color that I'm using. So for example, say I'm looking at the dark side of my strawberry and the light side. Say that's like too crisp, it looks too cookie cutter and fake. What do I do to make it look more realistic? Well, I could blend it, um, or I could mix an intermediate red and do the same thing I've been doing and make a shape of intermediate red in between the dark side and the light side which is what I've done here. The reason that's different is because it keeps the power behind your painting. Um, it keeps the power of those shapes and it lets you control. It's an easier way to like keep yourself under control with making sure that you don't just blend your piece into oblivion. If everything's a brush stroke, then um, it just ends up being a more intentional choice and you find that you haven't accidentally just ruined all the energy of the painting. So no blending. Um, and also you'll see that I, I'm also still not covering all of the orange parts. I wanted to mention that one more time. In the future, I'm going to try to do even better at keeping the underpainting in like the key areas. So for example, you'll see that with the strawberries, I've pretty much covered it all up. In the future, I want to intentionally leave some underpainting in there too. But you can see around the edges, like uh, around the green parts of the strawberries, you'll see little pops of orange. And I'm going to do my darndest to make sure I don't cover those, because there's some magic there. Um, and it only looks better the more the painting goes it tends to be much easier for me now to leave some of those areas exposed for the foreground and the background. Um, I don't know why that is, but it's just easier for me. Maybe I like the texture of the canvas anyways, so I go lightly. But you'll see there's a ton of orange, like especially at the top part of the painting. Um, <clears throat> and I'll be keeping that there the whole time. That's going to be a part of my statement in this painting. Another way that um, I keep my colors strong and uh, unblended is by setting a habit of cleaning my brush very often. So when, when I'm done with a specific color shape what I do is I have this little jar of uh, walnut oil. I use walnut oil because it's, uh, it's non-toxic. And uh, I just rub my oil paint in that little jar and it takes off a bunch of the paint that I've used. And then um, I, I wipe my brush on a paper towel and then I've removed most of the paint on my brush from the previous color. And what that means is I can pick up another color on my canvas now, say like I get some more red for the strawberry, and now um, two colors aren't blending on my brush, the previous color and the new color. That's a really important and valuable technique um, that I've found for um, keeping your colors from getting too blended. It's kind of a discipline that you need to create because um, it can be kind of tedious to, oh, I gotta wipe my brush again, gotta wipe my brush again. But if you can set in that habit when you paint, um, your colors are naturally gonna be a lot stronger and a lot more dynamic um, because there isn't blending going on. Because brushes do blend, like even picking up different colors, there's a blending that happens before you, before you even touch the canvas. And uh, you only want to do that if you want to do that. You know, you don't want to accidentally blend stuff. You want it to be 
an intentional decision because blending um, always makes your painting weaker if it's if it's not done with intention. Another way to make sure that you get really strong colors is by taking a lot of ownership in your color mixing. Um, the best way I've found to blend colors like really confidently is to start off every painting with just the primary colors. I know, like what? That sounds like it would take forever. <laughs> but um, that's a way of really getting control of the colors that you create. And that's a way to get incredible familiarity with the color wheel is by just starting every single painting with red, blue, yellow, and white and learn to get every color imaginable from just those colors. You're gonna get some really powerful colors when you get a sense of how to mix these colors on a canvas to, to get what you specifically want. Um, and I've got a, an entire hour long video just on that. It's called The Ultimate Guide to Color Mixing and I would definitely recommend checking that out if you, um, if you don't know how to make every single color imaginable. That's a great skill to have. So I'm doing kind of the finishing touches now on this painting. I'm probably about to throw my signature on it. Um, but you'll see I'm, I'm touching up on the foreground again. And here, um, what I've chosen to do is I've warmed up the background color a bit and made it a little bit lighter. And on the left-hand side, which remember is where the light is shining from, I'm putting down a foreground color that's a little bit lighter and a little bit warmer. So it's got a little bit more yellow in it. Um, and that just kind of, number one, reinforces the sense of, um, of lights and darks. Um, and in addition, it adds a little bit of visual interest because now the, uh, the foreground isn't just one flat, you know, light teal color. It's got a little bit more visual interest to it. So I'm accomplishing two things there. Um, you'll see I've also left my brush strokes very active in the foreground and background. Um, some people say that that's not a good idea because it detracts from the main focal point, which is, you know, obviously the light part of my strawberries. Um, so, you know, th I think the foreground and background could be an area where you could blend out a little bit more and that would assist with your contrast. That's another type of contrast is the brushstroke energy. But I just love those chunky brushstrokes. Even on the foreground and background, I just think it's fun. So <laughs> now you'll see my back here. Um, I'm putting in my signature and uh, you may notice there's like a funny strap on my back. That's a, that's a postural thing that I use to, uh, you know, keep my ergonomics correct. Kind of like sets your back a little more straight and level. And um, that just helps me to paint on a more regular basis. You know, if I have a tendency to have really bad posture, and so I hunch a ton. And I tell you, after hunching for a month, like my forearms are just killing me and I end up needing to take time away from art. So um, yeah, that's just an ergonomic thing that I do to, uh, to keep myself painting as often as I possibly can. All right, so that's the end of this painting. I hope you enjoyed my walkthrough. Um, if you did do a painting for this, I would love for you to share it with me. I'd love to see the painting that you created, even if it's not strawberries, even if you just listened to me and painted. Um, I would absolutely love to see it. I, uh, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for spending some time with me, and uh, I wish you the best on your painting journey this month. Happy painting, everyone.